This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. As Ben tries to sit still and not have his chair squeak, and I'm sitting here at home hoping my dog stays quiet for a couple more minutes. (laughs) That dog's been good. We've been uh, recording for a while. The dog's been great, actually. Yeah, so we record the intro after we record the episode. I think most people know that now. Anyways, you wanted to kick it off by talking about the the new facility we have on the Rational Reminder website. Yeah, so we're trying out a new comment engine called Commento. It allows for upvotes and downvotes and threaded discussions. It feels a lot like Reddit, which is awesome. Some people have said we should start our own subreddit to talk about this stuff. I kind of like the idea of something that we can take with us to whatever website we have. Yeah, it feels Uh, like a community, which I think is good. Yeah. So anyway, if you have comments and questions, I get a lot of emails from podcast listeners, which is awesome. If you can instead post those comments and questions on the Rational Reminder site, that to me just feels better because I don't think answering or receiving lots of individual emails scales very well. I think if people post their comments on the website, then other people can see it. And then maybe they don't send the question in because they see the answer or they see somebody else has already asked it. Uh, yeah. So anyway, we, we're, yeah, we're trying this thing out. With a, hop on another question that might improve the answer as well. So true. I think it's just good. And it turns into a discussion in a community like you uh, like you said. So yeah. at, at the rationalreminder.ca website, we have like a blog post for every podcast episode. At the end, there's a section for comments. So yes, please direct your comments and questions there. And speaking of questions, today we have a new, well, just for today anyways, we tried a rapid fire series of questions back and forth just to kind of mop up some of the questions that have come in lately, which has been great. So some very good questions. I don't know how rapid fire it was in the end, but we did our best. Some were, the first five were pretty rapid, but it was good. And also we're on YouTube. So if you want to see Ben's new Schwinn Airdyne Pro bike, it's in the background of his barely, of his barely video. See, barely you can barely see, see it. it. <laughs> but it's there. It is there. So yeah. you're actually using it every day? I've used it every day except for two since I got it. So that's seven out of nine days i think nice i've only missed one day since we've been home and this is week nine only missed one day on the peloton wow so now you have some some colleagues uh, who i know are listening who we now try to ride most saturdays i can't keep up to them man i don't know how they do the calorie burn they do but anyways i'm getting better every week how do you guys measure what you ride well the data is all there right so it measures your your output how many kilometers do you go what is it now Oh, I forget. It's in half an hour, it'll burn almost 500 calories. That's the main measurement. I think it's like 18, 19 kilometers in half an hour. That makes sense. Yeah. So have you yet watched The Last Dance? Nope. Oh, it is so good. So they drop, we watched the first four. They dropped two more on, whatever it was, this week. And two more came out this week. Last Two came out last week. Two come out this week. Wow, what a series. You got to watch it. It is so good so fascinating the drive that jordan have and the impact he had to get the team to drive for victory during the 90s incredible yeah Absolutely the, the, the incredible. thing that recently i saw something that compelled me to watch it which was that there's a and this is from someone who i know knows basketball they said that there's a whole storyline in there that they hadn't previously know, known about so that i just kind of figured i know that i know the jordan story but maybe maybe i don't so i i might check it out well it's also ownership and management and coaching but it's his, man, once he's down and his drive to victory, and I mean, you take that with his unbelievable skill. Like basketball is so much fun to watch, but he is just insanely talented. But he was around other like Dennis Rodman and, and Scottie Pippen. I mean, these guys are crazy talented. So anyway, I love it. Absolutely love it. Can't wait for the next, uh, next two to get dropped. Anything else? Nope, let's uh, head on over to the episode. There we go. Welcome to episode 98 of the Rational Reminder Podcast. So for recent content, you wanted to kick it off by talking about the Joe Rogan show? Yeah, I don't always listen to it, but Elon Musk was on there again, and I find it to be interesting. I mean, I think everybody does. (laughs) Yeah. The the overall conversation was, I mean, interesting, but not super relevant to, like, it's not going to change your life. It's like interesting to hear that somebody like him is thinking about these things. But that something that he said at the beginning, I thought was interesting, and in that he's talked recently about getting rid of all of his or a lot of his material possessions, 
And Joe Rogan asked him about that. And he said, I don't remember the exact words, but I remember the idea. He said that possessions become an attack vector when you're very wealthy. So as a billionaire, it's an, it's easy for people to come at him and whatever, say bad things about all the stuff that he has. And he does own a whole bunch of houses. So he wanted to eliminate that attack vector. But then he also said that- That's interesting. He, he's very conscious about being attacked. Yeah. Has some sort of negative impact on him, obviously. Yeah. And he says that there's a negative stigma associated with being a billionaire today. Uh, and, and he said that to him, it's perplexing because he's- I can't remember the exact wording that he used, but he's he's created this company uh, or these companies that are doing lots of great things and creating jobs and making the world a better place. And he gets now more capital to to allocate because of that. And so he's saying, I don't know why this becomes a bad thing. And then th- this is the part that I found most interesting. He says that there's a there's a conflation of spending and capital allocation. So there's a conflation that, that, that the stigma that we have for billionaires comes from this conflation of spending because billionaires can choose to spend a lot and right. the ability to allocate capital because the, the capitalist machine has deemed you to be one of the best capital allocators. Right. But you don't, what they invest their capital on in terms of their business and creating new projects is probably much, much larger than what he spends on his own personal stuff. But the personal stuff is easier to attack on, I guess. That's, I think that's what he's getting at. So now he's just saying, I'm not going to have any personal stuff so that people can only <laughs> view me as an allocator of capital. Interesting. Just eliminate the argument completely. Yeah, we'll eliminate the attack vector in his words. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Anything else to add to that? Nope. And I only listened to the first half of the episode. So if there was other stuff discussed in the second half, I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next podcast. I'll go check it out and listen to it. I had a couple of books just quickly. One is Shane Parrish, our good friend Shane Parrish's new book, The Great Mental Models. I know you and I got a copy of the first book. Well, I ordered the second volume, which again, it's about the great mental models. And this one is about physics, chemistry, and biology, which is, it was not at all what I was expecting. I knew it would be about mental models, but it's interesting how he takes these rules from these sciences and applies it to real world situations. And, uh, I mean, we all know that Shane Parrish and Farnham Street and, and the Knowledge Project is all about helping people improve and learn and develop their mental disciplines to, to lead a better life. Uh, and this book kicks off, if you can believe it, with the theory of relativity and how it's founded on empathy. And to quote, not empathy in the ordinary sense, but in a rigorous scientific sense. The crucial idea is to imagine how things would appear to someone who is moving in a different way than you are. Wow. And and he gives a scientific example of if you're on a boat and you're dropping a ball, well, you know, gravity pulls that ball to the bottom. So to you, it looks like the ball is falling straight down. But if there was a porthole and someone was on shore seeing it, they might see the ball kind of go with the boat, right? So it's not directly vertical. So he then links it to, you know, taking a different perspective in looking at life. And he does a really nice job about it. And much like his first book, the, the physical presence of the book is impressive. It's beautifully constructed, beautiful paper, beautiful fonts. So you, you get this whole, I mean, the book is almost representative of what's in the book. It's this complicated, beautifully built thing to give you a framework to make better decisions, which is what the book is about. So great, great book. Took a long time for it to come in. I think it's sold out. Wow. On Amazon now, highly recommend uh, you get your copy. Oh, Shane so, puts out great stuff. He's such yeah. a thoughtful guy. Yeah. So the next chapter is on thermodynamics. I know this is entering into your field of engineering, so it'll be neat to see how he links that to better mental models. Yeah. And the other book quickly is a book called Smarter, Faster, Better by Charles Duhigg. Terrific book. It's actually one of the nine top books recommended by our good friend Aiden Merze of uh, the Fellow app. He put out a tweet a couple of weeks ago recommending this as one of his top nine books that will, his quote here, they'll help you lead with confidence. So I ordered it up. The book was inspired by another author, Atul Gawande, who wrote the, the very famous and excellent book called The Checklist Manifesto. So Charles Duhigg took two years to dig into the science of productivity and he just poured over scientific research 
for two years into eight different categories. And the categories are motivation, teams, focus, goal setting, managing others, decision making, innovation, and absorbing data. Now, what is so good about this book is that each chapter basically stands alone. And it's, they're just fabulously written, really interesting. One quick example, because I'm sure you're going to ask me that, is on goal setting. He talks about how stretch goals can spark innovation, but only when people have a system for breaking that big goal into concrete plans. And we've all heard about having a, a big, hairy, audacious goal. And that is motivating to some people. While it may be motivating, if you can't turn that goal into action, his point is kind of what good is it? So it's all about being able to break that goal down into concrete steps. Uh, another thing you talked about too is, is uh, and this really related to me, is to be aware if you have a high drive towards cognitive closure. And I have this pretty seriously where I love to get things done. So he says to watch for when your drive for closure doesn't freeze you from considering other information that may be important in making that decision. And I have to be very conscious about that for me. So it's interesting. He talks about that at, at quite a length about this, this cognitive closure need. And other couple of good stories about what can be learned from some pretty serious plane crashes in history and, and how their behavioral things that happened during those crashes. Again, fantastic book. Cool. I've actually read it. There's my content tips for the for this week since we missed it last week, last time. Oh yeah, we did. We changed the structure last time. Yeah. So on to the rapid fire questions. Yeah. So as we mentioned in the introduction, we're introducing, maybe this is the only time we do it. I don't know. Unless people say they love it. Although I guess we're also limited by the number of listener questions. But we had, for whatever reason, a ton of new listener questions that came in uh, between the last episode and this one. And sometimes I look at listener questions and they're they're not interesting to answer uh, or they're easy to answer in like a quick email response to the person answering the question, asking the question. But for whatever reason, this week we had a whole bunch that were good questions, interesting to discuss. So rather than trying to spread them out, we just decided let's insert this maybe one time section of rapid fire question and answer. All right, let's make it rapid. We'll kick off the first one, which is an audio question. Hi, Ben. I'm a U.S. investor from Portland, Oregon in my late 20s, hoping to capture the value and size premiums. In your paper, Factor Investing with ETFs, you outline a sample portfolio that includes a 22% equity tilt towards U.S. large value and U.S. small value ETFs. Would you consider this to be a more conservative or aggressive value tilt? And what would be your upper limit of tilt for a long-term investor? Yeah. So... The first thing to note is that the model portfolios in that paper are being revamped. Like anyone that pays attention will notice that we've taken the model portfolios down off of our website. That was because the historical data was past six months stale. And I don't think we're allowed to have it posted when it's that old. But anyway, we're taking a bit of time to revamp them. Uh, we've got our eye on, on a couple of newer ETFs, but I'm kind of just waiting until they have a bit more performance history. Anyway, in that factor investing with ETFs paper, I, I would call the tilts conservative. I mean, the the design there was meant to match what Dimensional does in their portfolios, which again is a, a preference-based tilt that is aggressive enough to give you higher expected returns, but not aggressive enough to result in really extreme tracking error, which is always the risk with factor investing. And this year has been a really good example of that. The most aggressive tilt that you can get without leverage is something like what Alpha Architect is doing. So they're concentrating, uh, I looked at their QVAL ETF is 41 stocks. So that's a 40, 41 of the cheapest, but still high quality stocks that you can get. So it, it, what is aggressive? I mean, that, that is. With the ETFs that we have in that model portfolio, it was IUSV and IJS, if I remember correctly. That's what was in our model portfolios anyway. In terms of a factor tilt, I think those are pretty conservative. Like IUSV is market-wide value. IGS is small cap value, but they're both fairly diversified. Like IGS is 488 small value stocks. And remember QVAL, I said, has 41 Big stocks. Big difference. Yeah. So, I mean, you can go factor tilt is kind of step one and then concentration gets you more exposure to that factor tilt. I think with concentration, you start introducing the possibility for having a big alpha positive or negative. 
like an unexplained component of the return just by missing stocks. And based on the distribution of stock returns, that concentration probably gives you a negative alpha on average. Although I think West from Alpha Architect would counter that because they're finding undervalued stocks, it's not a risk story. You'd expect a positive alpha. But anyway, that's a different debate for a different day. Ultimately, I think the level of the tilt is highly subjective. Like I mentioned before, Dimensional basically built a, t- a preference-based tilt based on what they, they what the advisors that they were working with thought that their clients could handle. And we're living that now where we have a, a slight tilt towards small and value. And even that slight tilt when you know values trailing or small values trailing market by negative 20 percent so far this year, even a slight overweight starts to make a pretty, pretty significant difference. And then just one more note on the idea of factor tilting being aggressive versus not aggressive. I I don't think it's as much about the absolute level of risk. Like, I don't know if it's fair to say that adding small value and value together with market increases your absolute level of risk. And I say that because they're independent risks. Like, I don't think going adding small value to market is not the same thing as decreasing your bond exposure. Absolutely agree. Like decreasing bond exposure, that's decreasing equity risk. Adding small value is adding an independent equity risk yep. factor. Yeah. So I, I think that all, it's going to come down to preference and the risk is really just tracking error. Higher, higher tracking error comes with more factor exposure. Question number two is for you, and you get one minute less to answer this one because we said oh. three minutes for each one. So you get two minutes for this one. Okay. Is there any noticeable benefit in trying to capture some size premium in Canada by using a combination of ETFs such as a mixture of XIU or XIC with XMD or XCS? Okay. So XIU is uh, S&P TSX 60. It's short small cap. It's the 60 largest stocks in the country. By nature of excluding small cap, it's short small cap. So going XIU plus a small cap ETF, you're just going to get market. You should have just bought XIC. So if you're starting with XIC and you're talking about adding XMD or XCS, they're both small cap universe funds, which includes the small growth, low profitability, which uh, we've talked about in the past, really hurts the risk adjusted returns of small cap. Now, Cliff Asnes, I made that suggestion to him that if you're going to go for small cap, you, you have to basically go small cap value because small cap universe drags your performance. And Cliff disagreed. I think Cliff would disagree with anything anybody said. <laughs> it's just what he does. But, but anyway, he, may, he came back with a very, very good point. And that was in episode 93 that we had Cliff. He said that small cap universe has a higher beta than the market portfolio. So it's got, it doesn't give you in, the independent risk that like small value does, for example, but it does give you a higher beta. So if you want to have a riskier portfolio, you're already 100% equity and you don't want to use leverage, using something like XCS or XMD could give you the higher beta. So if that's the goal, more market risk, more market beta than just a market portfolio and you don't want leverage, then you could use one of those ETFs. But you've got to remember that that comment I made earlier about factor risks not necessarily being additive. In this case, it is because it's not an independent risk factor. You're getting more market beta. Done. Done. There you go. Right to the second. Well done. Okay. Next one's for you. How do you adjust RESP asset allocation as kids get closer to school age? And what do you do with leftover money in the RSP? So can you tell that certain questions are designed for you more than me? (laughs) I think they're on to us. So uh, I learned early in my career that many people consider RESP saving sacred. So I learned to be very in tune with people's risk profile on the RESPs because it isn't always about the time frame, a lot of people view the RESP just as a vehicle. They got the 20% grant and prefer to be very conservative. So my kids are 19 and 21, so they are at their tail end of their RESP benefit. So we maximize all through the years and we started the early years with all equity. And I think once they got to be about eight or 10 years old, we migrated over to 60, 40 portfolio. And then when I think they were 15, uh, we flipped to 40, 60. So 40 equity, 60% bond. And we've left it there. There's about a third of the account left, the back end for them to use up. So I think it really comes down to whether or not you need the money to fund education costs. So if you don't need it and you wanted to defer it, that is an argument to have more equity tilt, but realizing that you could get some sort of left-hand tail-end performance that could hurt you. 
It also becomes a question of tax planning because, of course, uh, the growth and grant comes out taxable. So if your children aren't working, you may want to take some money out early on just to to trigger that taxable income in their low tax bracket hands. And if you don't need the money and they're over 18 years old, they may have enough TFSA room to use up those funds in their own name. But again, you have to make sure that your kids are mature enough to properly handle an account in their own name and they don't go and blow it on other things that you might deem to be appropriate. But a lot of people we've seen, you know, leave it right to the end, let it defer the growth as long as they possibly can, other than the tax side, of course. Anything you would add to that? No, I, yeah, I, I think that the biggest takeaway for this one is, is that the, the time horizon for the RESP is way more flexible than most people think it is. And like your comment about it being sacred, I agree, but I think that's also a, a, a flaw in thinking about it. It's sacred because it's very easy to use mental accounting and allocate this specifically to education costs, but it's just another bucket of assets. Absolutely it is. The only special characteristics are the way that it's taxed, which is related to a child being enrolled in post-secondary education, but there's no requirement to take it out to pay for school. But sometimes you'd be talking to parents who have not maximized and you talk to them and their kids would be 12, 13, 14, and they're planning on using their line of credit. And so instead of using the line of credit, use your line of credit now to get the grant and then invest it from there. So- yeah, I mean, everyone should use the RESP. I, I guess unless you're certain that the child wasn't going to go to school, and even then, you could probably make an argument for using it. Because if you think about it, if somebody doesn't go, if the child doesn't go to school, post secondary education, qualifying post secondary education, which is a pretty broad category, it's not just university. If they don't go, worst case is you pay back the grants, you pay tax at your tax rate plus a penalty on the growth, and you get your contributions back without any penalty or anything like that. So worst case is not that bad. But on the asset allocation piece, if you were 100% equity and markets were down and you didn't need this asset to pay for school, if you could afford it from cash flow, you could just leave it invested until they were done. And I think it's six months after they finished their program that you can do the tax efficient withdrawal. So depending on their tax situation too, because obviously all the income's taxable to them. You just to see their lower tax brackets go by each year when you could take it out and do their TFSA if you didn't need the money. But you can take it out and stick it in. I mean, assuming that you can get it out tax efficiently, you can put it yep. in whatever. You can leave yep. it invested is the point. Yep. I agree. You can, you can take it out of, t- out of the RESP and reinvest it in whatever other account, maybe a taxable account. But from an asset allocation, from an investing perspective, you're not constrained by the time the child's in school or especially when they enroll in school. Yep. Another one for you. W- what ETFs would be best to use while implementing the Smith Maneuver? Should it be treated just like any other non-registered account? A vast majority of people online are saying that investing in dividend paying individual stocks is the best way to go for the Smith Maneuver. What would be your take on this? Sure. Throw me the dividend question. Keep your <laughs> blood pressure down. Uh, well, first of all, my bias is against leverage. That's a personal thing. I prefer to build a plan that doesn't require leverage. I, I really like the term that Wade Fowl used a few episodes ago talking about safety first planning, uh, but that's just my personal bias. So for people to say to use dividend stocks because it allows you to take your tax efficient dividends earned in that account the idea is to use that to pay down the non-deductible part and that cash flow just comes in. So we've talked about dividends probably dozens of times in this podcast. And I get the appeal of having dividends come in. So it just flows across the non-deductible side. The problem is you end up with a much more concentrated portfolio of Canadian stocks. That's the biggest thing you're giving up. If you're going to behave better because you own dividend stocks, and again, we've said this many, many times before, fine, own dividend paying stocks, but there's no reason to expect them to perform any better. I personally just stick with whatever portfolio you deem to be appropriate for you and stick with that. Yeah, I agree. There are little little snags, like if you're doing a Smith maneuver and you're using ETFs and there's return of capital, that can ad- ad- affect the deductibility of the loan technically, which is another reason I think people say to use dividend stocks. But yeah, I think what you said is the best way to think about it. Okay. Here's one for you. Has the role of bonds or bond ETFs changed in light of COVID-19 and the resulting downstream effect on bonds, government or corporate? So I I, I think what this question is probably getting at is uh, all of the fiscal stimulus that's been going on. Governments are borrowing, borrowing lots of money, going into big deficits to stimulate the economy or to provide liquidity to people and businesses. The concern when that's happening is what happens if governments can't borrow anymore? So governments are borrowing more, borrowing more and more money, increasing the supply of safe government bonds. What happens if people stop buying them? Well, interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So are they really still a safe asset in that environment? I think that right now, 
looking at the world the way, well, the, as it is now, bond yields are still extremely low. Like bond prices have come up this year, and people keep saying that can't happen anymore. <laughs> the end, the end of the bond bull market. And I agree, <laughs> it's, it's got it for years. It's got to stop at some point. And we're going to talk more about bond, like long term bond returns, in a, in another segment of the of the episode today. But based on that, based on prices being high, yields being low, the demand for safe debt is very high right now. Is that going to dry up? I mean, that's a question that I that I can't answer. We can maybe look at Japan as an example of how this has played out in other countries. But Japan's kind of gone through what it looks like. Maybe developed countries like Canada and the US are going through now. They've done massive stimulus packages for years now, monetary and fiscal. We're talking about fiscal here. Japan's debt to GDP now, right now, is above 200%. The US is a little over 100%. Canada's at, at about 50%. Really? Interesting. Now, I think one of the criticisms of that statistic for Canada is that a lot of our services are provincially run, and so a lot of our debt is actually provincial debt. Oh, so that's just federal. Yeah, so that might not be totally accurate. But anyway, the fo- focus on the US then. Either way, Japan's at a much higher debt to GDP ratio. Now, Japan's debt has gone up steadily since the 1990s when they had their big economic shakeup and that they've still kind of been struggling to recover from. So debt keeps going up and up. So maybe we look at what their bond returns have been like over that time period. This is not an academic research paper. I just thought it was an interesting data point. So Japanese government bond returns hedge to US dollars. And we have to do the hedge, otherwise you get the currency volatility in there. So this is US dollar performance, like evaluated in US dollar terms. Since 1990, Japanese government bonds have returned 5.83% annualized, mm-hmm. while the US government bonds have returned 5.77%. And global government bonds hedged to USD have returned 6.02%. So all pretty oh, very, similar. Very tight. Very tight. Risk adjusted, it's actually interesting over this time period, world government bond hedged to USD has had meaning, meaningful, I mean, it's all relatively small differences because we're talking about fixed income, but pretty serious difference in risk-adjusted returns over this time period. But anyway, that's not the point here. Point is, Japan, <laughs> bond market's been fine despite their continuously increasing debt. That's not to say it's not going to collapse one day. Maybe. I can't predict the future either. But if that's any proxy for what could happen, the U.S. has a long way to go before their debt levels start to look like that. As, as long as there's global demand for bonds from these types of countries, Japan, the U.S., Canada, sure, maybe a bit scary with all the oil stuff happening for our economy, but hey. So I think as long as that demand stays high, I don't think bonds are, their role in the portfolio has not changed. Their yields are low, but you didn't own bonds to be a high yielding asset in the first place. And now, to be fair, as low as bond yields are, and like you said, Cameron, people have been saying for years that bond returns are going to be terrible. They're going to be terrible. They're going to be terrible. And they've been fantastic. Especially long bonds. Yeah. <laughs> Especially long bonds. But even just ZAG, aggregate bonds in Canada is up 5% year to date. Yep. Next question. And I'll take, take uh, some time back from you. So what do you think about Well Simple's claim that their well-designed portfolios protected their clients in this downturn? So we... Uh, we talked about Well Simple's portfolio update in an earlier episode, and you basically said you didn't agree with some of their main philosophical and structural decisions. But they they posted an article, I believe it was late last month, which was kind of sounded like a victory lap on those changes that they made. So, given your prior commentary, our prior commentary in this letter, what do you think? Well, I got a bunch of questions about it, probably because we we put that commentary <laughs> out there for everyone to see, and then Well Simple comes back and has. This, uh, I don't know what you call it, empirical evidence that their decisions were good ones. Here we go. That's more of an anecdote, not really empirical <laughs> evidence. Anyway. So in their article, they're basically saying, we, we made all these changes that we told you about, and we, we did them for these reasons, and they worked in this downturn. So we, we protected your downside. And they're attributing that mostly to low vol stocks, which we talked about way back whenever we had that discussion about this, and long-term government bonds. Now, the, the, the framework for doing that I don't. I can't remember if we talked about this last time we discussed this or not. But the framework for doing that is based on, I guess, risk parity would be the framework. So it's like if you own a sixty forty portfolio of stocks and aggregate bonds or short term bonds, the risk in that portfolio, even though it's sixty percent by asset allocation, the risk is dominated by stocks. If you measure risk as volatility, 
the, the volatility contribution to that portfolio is I think probably 90 or more percent of it comes from the stock allocation, even if it's a 60, 40 portfolio. So the, the idea behind adding long bonds is that they're going to be much more volatile, but negatively correlated or uncorrelated or whatever with, with stocks, probably a slight negative correlation uh, in the historical data anyway. So that, that's the idea is if we add these long bonds in there, the risk contribution of our fixed income portion of the portfolio is going to be higher. And that should be a good thing over the long term in, in terms of risk adjusted returns, I guess. Now in a risk parity world, you don't care about expected returns. You only care about risk adjusted returns and you leverage up uh, to the expected return level you want. Anyway, they're not going total risk parity, but it's sort of approaching that framework. Now, this year, low vol stocks have done better than the market. If you look at ACWV, which is what they talked about using in the paper that we critiqued, I don't know if that's actually what they're using in portfolios, must be. Uh, compare that to ACWI. So that's all country world uh, index low vol versus all country world index from iShares. They've got about a 3% premium over the market, low volatility stocks, which is meaningful. Year to date. Yeah. I mean, that's a tiny portion of their relatively good performance compared to the market. Most of it's coming from the long bonds. So across all of their model portfolios, again, this is from their white paper where they showed, I think, conservative, moderate, and aggressive. All of them were 15 to 20% long-term Canadian government bonds uh, using the ETF ZFL from BMO. Now that ETF, when I looked, uh, I haven't looked today, but as of last week, it was up 12% year to date. Keeping in mind everything else is down, you know, double digits. So it's up 12% in Canadian dollar terms. Now, I mean, that, that is what it is, right? Like uh, we just talked about the demand for safe government debt, which is causing prices, bond prices to go up and yields to go down. Well, the longer you are on the maturity spectrum, the more of an effect you're going to feel from that. And we see that with this 12% year-to-date return. Completely unexpected. Maybe. Yeah. I, I mean, to, to the extent that it's gone up. Yeah. I think when markets are down generally, well, bond bond prices can take a hit. And I, they, they, did, they did at the beginning of this. But yeah, I, I got, people really want safe assets, I guess, is the only way to think about that, despite all of the government spending. But anyway, yeah. So I, I agree. Not necessarily expected. Not totally unexpected, but to that extent, yeah, maybe not expected. 12% year to date was not expected. Yeah. Yeah. That might be some resulting yeah. that's going on there. And so if, if you compare that portfolio that has the low volatility stocks and the long bonds to an equity fixed income portfolio using like small value stocks in the equities and, and relatively shorter midterm bonds in the fixed income, well, simple looks really smart. Their portfolio managers look really smart or investment strategy team, whatever, whoever did all that thinking. And I mean, it is that risk parity concept is sort of paying off. So it, it seems like a good idea to take a victory lap. But the question that started popping into my head as I was reading their victory lap and got all these questions from people. And Cameron, you and I talked about this in a different context, actually, because we were talking about value stocks versus the market. But is volatility or drawdown a good measure of risk? Our critique of, of long-term bonds, when we critiqued this portfolio a while ago, was that they have poor risk-adjusted returns on their own. So their expected, expected return profile is not great. Now, we're taking also, a more risk than expect to return. Correct. Because they're so long and more volatile in price. You get an equity-like volatility without an equity-like expected return. Now, if you get negative correlation with stocks, that could be not such, bad, not such a bad thing. And that's that kind of risk parity idea. So while Simple finished their victory lap commentary by saying how investments perform in downturns may be more important than how they perform in rallies. And that raises the question that I just mentioned, Cameron, which is, is drawdown risk? Or what is risk? And we've talked about this framing risk in the past. Anyway, so I built a model <laughs> to try and measure risk in a different way. Uh, and it was a consumption-based model, basically just a 4% rule withdrawal model. So I looked at the historical risk-adjusted returns. I compared portfolio characteristics first, and then I did the, the other thing. So historical risk-adjusted returns of a 70-30, this is US equities and US fixed income. 70-30 US equity with five-year treasury notes versus 70-30 US equity with long-term government bonds. And I looked at data going from 1926, July 1926 to March 2020. The long-term bond portfolio with the 
30% long-term bond allocation outperformed by an annualized 20 basis points for the full period. The risk-adjusted performance was almost identical. So that was interesting on its own. Uh, now, these data include the, 40, the last 40 years, which have been this bull market that everyone keeps, the bond bull market that everyone keeps saying has to end eventually. So I thought, well, let's look at the data ending when that started, which is July 1981, when interest rates peaked. Over that period, the long-term bond portfolio underperformed by 24 basis points annualized, and it was more volatile. So this is from 1926 to 1981. Correct. So full period, including the last 40 years or 40 or so years. So it's 94 years, including the last 40. Right. Got it. So full period uh, underperformed in absolute terms, risk-adjusted returns were about the same. But if we carve out the last 40 years with that crazy bond bull market, which we can't structurally have again because interest rates are as low as they are, then over that period, it underperformed in absolute and risk-adjusted terms. That's when, that's when I started asking the question about the consumption model. We know that adding long bonds might help in major downturns. And actually, in the historical data, it doesn't really that much on average, which is also interesting. And it maybe speaks to some of the simulations here. But if we take the consumption approach, like what are, what are the chances of not being able to meet your financial objectives, your consumption ob- objectives? So you're defining that as risk as opposed to drawdown or volatility. Correct. The risk of not being able to spend as much as you want. Correct. So I ran 764 historical 30-year simulations using 4% withdrawals, just because I know that works in the aggregate data. Like in just market with five-year treasuries, I know 4% works based on the 4% rule research. So starting with a $1 million portfolio, with five-year treasuries as fixed income, there's one instance of failure. And we know this again from the 4% rule research. That's December 1968. So if the 30 years starting December 1968 is the one period in the historical data where the 4% rule fails in the US right. data. So this is real numbers, real market returns. Correct. Using historical data. I, I thought about doing a bootstrap too. And I built the bootstrap model, which was kind of fun to, to build in, in Visual Basic. But then I, I, I kind of realized that it, it blows up the whole concept behind what Wellsimple is trying to do. Because as soon as you go bootstrap, you eliminate correlations. Positive and negative. All right. So it, it just does, it didn't work, uh, or didn't work to illustrate what I wanted to illustrate. But using rolling historical periods, you do get that. Anyway, uh, I think people have kind of figured out this is not going to be a rapid fire answer. <laughs> ah, shoot, you're right. <laughs> anyway, this is good. It's interesting. Hopefully, uh, listeners hopefully agree. Hopefully, it's interesting. Yeah, you're right. Though it's not rapid fire. I got too interested. <laughs> so that that works out to a zero point one three percent historical failure rate. Right. Now, if you add long-term bonds as fixed income, the historical failure rate increases to 4.6%. Wow. Yeah. And it's basically, I, I tried to go back and because I, I had the same reaction, like how, why would it make that much how of a difference? That many more times. It's- and, and especially because the risk-adjusted returns aren't that much different on average over the, over the very long term. So I went volatility? back and looked in the data. It's basically in the run-up to peak interest rates in the 1980s. So it's basically that long bond, bond bear market there were a whole bunch of failures. That being at the back end or the front end? Uh, I was like, at the front end because it burnt capital up front. I didn't look at that. I didn't look in that much detail. That's really interesting. I just looked at which, which starting months did this fail over 30 years. And it was all in the sort of 19, mid, mid to late 1960s, which is when that, the, the interest rates were going up, 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 up. And inflation was high. So you have all these things working against you. And that's the same period where using five-year treasuries, that portfolio failed then too. It's just there were way more instances of failure using long bonds because you got smoked on the on the interest rates on yeah. the interest rate sensitivity. Wow. Yeah. So if we're defining risk as consumption, at least in the historical data, uh, adding the long bonds not so good. The average ending assets, which I guess we'd expect based on the risk adjusted returns being pretty similar over the long term, average ending assets were pretty similar. Average maximum drawdown was also similar, which I found interesting. So that negative correlation of the long bonds and the stocks didn't seem to work that well. Drawdown being the bottoming out of the portfolio. Yeah. So the peak peak to trough, the biggest peak to drop drop, it was a little bit higher for the portfolio with treasuries as opposed to long bonds. But like I'm talking about points of a percent. And then, then I thought, well, I'll just push this analysis one step further because I'm already, I've already got the model. And I said, what if we just said we actually don't mind drawdown and volatility? Like let's use stocks that we know to have higher risk adjusted returns, but but also to be much more volatile. So I've replaced stocks in my 30% treasuries portfolio. I've replaced total market stocks with 
US small value stocks. 100% on the equity side. Yeah. So 70% wow. US small value, 30% <laughs> five-year treasuries. Now, I know that there's sample bias here. And, and if I used yeah. some other country, it might not be the same. We, we know US small value has very strong historical characteristics, but they're also volatile. But you want to and, the extreme barbell. Larry Swedjo calls this the barbell portfolio. Yeah. Right. And it comes back to, to Well Simple's point, which was how, how investments perform in downturns may be more important than how they perform in rallies. So this really tests that point. So with small value stocks, the failure rate goes to 0%. Remember with US market and treasuries, there was one instance of failure, much higher failure rate with the long bonds. Small yep. value and treasuries never failed <laughs> in, wow. in the historical data. <laughs> the maximum drawdown goes from 16, 68% to 77%. So bigger maximum drawdown, which Ouch. is crazy. 77% drawdown with a 70% equity portfolio. And it still never failed. And it still never failed. So the average maximum drawdown, so that's looking at every 30-year period, what was the maximum drawdown over that 30-year period, and then taking the average of that, went from 35% to 37%. That was also interesting. That average maximum drawdown wasn't that much worse over all the 30-year periods. But now this is the crazy part. The average ending assets increased by a multiple of five. It went from like 6 million on average ending assets after 30 years to 33 million. Wow. Yeah. So what is risk? Really fascinating question. Yeah. So my, my, my final note that I made to myself was that p- people might feel better about long bonds in their portfolio, especially in a year like this, where it's like, all right, this, this really helped, really helped cushion the blow. You know, you can make the same argument for gold. Gold's up, up a ton recently too, but the historical risk return characteristics are not great. And it really comes down to that difference in framework. Do you want to think about this from, from a expected return perspective, or do you want to think about portfolio construction from a risk parity perspective? Gold fits into a risk parity framework too. Long way of saying I still don't agree with uh, <laughs> with Well Simple's portfolios, and I think that the victory lap is unjustified. Great answer. That could have been our investment topic this week, but I <laughs> still have an investment topic for you. I hope people are happy about that. We have a lot of investment topics. We got a backlog of ideas to talk about. Yeah, there's so much to cover. Portfolio topic this week: the historic state of value investing. So where do you want to go with this? Do you want to kick it off? Well, it's oddly enough, it's not a question that comes up a lot in our role with clients. I mean, we have such diversified portfolios, but it sure is a big topic in, I know my Twitter feed and a lot of the academics and fin, FinTwit people that we both follow closely. This is a raging debate that's that's been going on. It's been some very, very interesting and good commentary that I think uh, you've done a great job of, of boiling this down into this these, these notes you've made up. But we've got now, what, 10, 12 years where value has unexpectedly, but did not deliver what you would expect, which is a bit of an excess return, excess premium. Now, we're biased in looking at articles for sure that suggest that the value premium isn't dead. So I think it's fair to acknowledge our biases but still, it's a good question. Is the value premium dead? Why should we continue to expect it? Yeah. So you dug into the data. It, it was kind of hard to parse through and decide which ones did I want to speak to or did we want to speak to? Because it's kind of like everybody, everybody that's a value manager right now is putting out research showing why we should expect value to do better or just analyzing the situation with value. And a lot of credible people and smart people. I, I ended up just pulling two from AQR which maybe increases the risk of bias. I don't know. But I think that they're pretty good in terms of their academic and intellectual integrity. I, I, I find those guys to be good. Uh, so I, I ended up pulling They did piece. that one paper and then Cliff jumped, Cliff Asses jumped on the weekend just to kind of summarize that paper. I thought it was just a very compelling, all data driven. Yeah. So there, there's one blog, long blog post from Cliff and we can link to all these in our post. And then there was the paper from AQR from some of Cliff's colleagues. And so I kind of made notes to summarize both of them. And I think we'll just go we'll just go through it. But the data are fascinating. It's like the the title of the section you said, Cameron, the historic state of value investing. And it truly is that. Anyway, should we jump into it? Yeah, it's interesting from a big picture how many people are finding reasons now why value is dead. And you go back through history, and I think it's fair to say this happened during similar periods in the past. Why value is dead. And it's like, why does that happen 
after values underperform? Why doesn't it happen after values perform really well? It's just interesting how you question it after, even though these periods, and we've talked about this many times before, are not unexpected. It's not what you expected, but you have to know to expect the unexpected. Yeah. And we talked, I think it was in our that COVID-19 episode we did a while ago, not that long ago, I guess. We talked a bunch about historical periods where value and small value have taken a real beating because that was happening again when all this started. And it's still happening. It's still happening now. Anyway, okay. So first I'm going to talk about the article that Cliff wrote. And I've just, I, I read through it a couple times and just made m- notes. So I hope it's okay for that with everyone that I'm basically just reading the notes that I took after reading somebody else's paper. This isn't exactly original content, but we'll try and put as much of our commentary in there as, as we he, can. He called his summary, the brute force commentary <laughs> of their paper. Just get to the point. Yeah. And then some other people on Twitter jumped on and even boiled it down to like 125 characters to summarize what he summarized. Yeah. And I'm not going to do Cliff's writing justice. So, I mean, I suggest you read his article, but here's here's my attempt at summarizing it. So, following the Fama French price to book uh, as, as a measure of value, which Cliff calls academic style, expensive stocks are sometimes less than 4% as expensive as cheap stocks. The median multiple... I guess, is 5.4 times. And today they're nearly 12 times more expensive. Like That is unbelievable. And what they're looking at is the one third most expensive stocks compared to the one third cheapest stocks. The middle third for this part has been eliminated. And if you look at the table, the spikes, there's a spike now, there's a spike in 2008. And this is now above the spike from 99, 2000. It's well, it depends. So Cliff talks about a bunch of different ways to measure it. And it, the way that he thinks is most reasonable to measure it, then yes, that this is right now, value's never been this cheap. The hundredth percentile. Yeah. So that's just the regular book to market book as Fama and French define it uh, without, without uh, constraining industries. So you end up overweight industries, the, the cheapest industries. So going back the 50 plus years of data that he's talking about, we're right now at the 100th percentile. So back to 1967. For just the the straight spread in valuation between cheap stocks and expensive stocks. Yep. And so Cliff comments that some people make the winner take all argument and claim that value measures don't apply anymore. But he also makes a little quip that I thought was funny. He says that this implies the trend is just starting and we should expect the spread to widen to infinity. It's just kind of funny. <laughs> so that so that so then he looked at other valuation metrics. I can't remember exactly which ones, price to cash flow, price to sales, all that kind of stuff. Price to sales was 83rd percentile. Which is the low, that's the lowest. But he also says once you constrain for industry, that goes away. But the main point is if, you, if we extend to other valuation metrics other than, other than price to book, things put, look pretty much the same. Well, call it still in the 100th percentile or very close. And then he said, what if we throw out technology, media, and telecoms for the Love full data history? Still close to the 100th percentile or at the 100th percentile. Right. So I think so. This time is different. Correct. If we throw out the, again, this again does the same thing. If we throw out the largest 5% of stocks for the entire data set, data set, still historically cheap, close so to or the winner take all out. argument. So yep. you're taking out the winners all the way through the data set, whether it's now, 2008, 1999, different names, throw them out. You're still at the 100th percentile. Yeah. If we go industry neutral, instead of letting the portfolio be overweight, the most expensive or the least expensive industries, depending on the portfolio we're talking about. You do the ranking within the industries. Same thing. Still, 100th percentile of cheapness. Yep. So then Cliff says, maybe cheap companies are just bad businesses. Like maybe they're truly just bad companies and that's why they're not doing well. And this to me was one of the most interesting parts. So he looked at gross profitability, a la Robert Novi Marx, who he references and mm-hmm. we've talked about in the past. Uh, gross profitability, he looks at return on assets and he looks at leverage to see like m- maybe these businesses just really suck right now. And that's what's driving this. And he finds that cheap stocks are currently in line with their historical profitability compared to expensive stocks. So expensive stocks do tend to be more profitable yep. than cheap stocks. People who are value investors just recognize like you, you really are buying beaten up businesses and that's just a fact of value investing. But compared to the historical difference in profitability, it's the same. It's I think he said the 52nd percentile. So it's pretty much in line with what has been historically on average. Return on assets right now are higher than uh, compared to history. And leverage right now for value stocks is lower compared to growth stocks than compared to history. So all of those metrics that you might call quality metrics, like how, how what is the quality of these businesses, show that 
relative to history, the history, remember, where value has outperformed over most time periods. I was reading another thing. I think it's like 90, 96% or some mid, mid to high 90% of 10-year historical periods where values outperformed growth. So through all of that history, as of right now, values metrics in terms of business quality look the same as average or better than all of that history where they've beaten growth stocks. So they're, they're not just bad businesses. And this one was was really interesting. And this is where you get that spike, Cameron, that you were talking about where it's higher than it was in the tech bubble in air quotes or video air quotes. <laughs> <laughs> so but when you measure the, the, the value spread based on intra-industry HML sorts, so that's constraining for industries, not letting an industry run away and take over the portfolio, while equal weighting the, the 1,000 largest stocks. And Cliff says that this way of sorting is the most realistic proxy for something like what AQR or a dimensional uh, would actually do on implementation in a portfolio. And doing that sort is where the value spread's never been as high in history. And you look at the chart, it's like, it, it's a good clip above where it's been in the past uh, mm-hmm. when, it's been, when it's been extremely high. It's interesting. I've had discussions about this with a few clients this week after having read Cliff's piece. Yeah. And it really does give you belief in your portfolio. Not that I've lost belief, but when clients hear these kinds of messages, to know that there is a counterbalance to what's going on in the world right now with this winner take all kind of mentality. I was listening to a podcast recently, and I can't remember which one. And so sorry to whoever it was, but they talked about how they, they talked about the difference between a winner take all market market for companies versus a winner take all all market for the end investors. We've implied this in the past, where it can be winner take all for the companies. But you're still buying discounted cash flows. Your, your expected returns are still based on the discount rate. So unless the market's grossly inefficient and consistently mispricing these large cap growth stocks, uh, in an efficient market, you can have a winner take all market at the corporate level, and it won't be a winner take all market at the investor portfolio level. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I just heard someone say that, and I thought it was an interesting way to frame it. Okay, so Cl- Cliff concludes that the cheapness of value today is not coming from a broken metric price book not from the winner take all companies it's not concentrated in tech mega caps or the most expensive stocks and uh, this is a direct quote from cliff we think the medium term odds are now rather dramatically on the side of value with no this time is different explanation we can find and we've tested a lot of them holding a drop of water and no other period in the 50 plus year history matching today now keep in mind cliff has said this a few times now and been <laughs> and been burned pretty hard <laughs> remember sin a little we talked about that yeah but he's saying, based on the way things, well, what did he say? We think the medium term odds are now rather dramatically on the side of value. It's always a scary thing to say, but he's saying it. <laughs> well, that's what happened coming out of 99, 2000. And our professional colleagues in the US that had value small cap portfolios, because at that point, it really wasn't available in Canada. That's really caused them to really thrive. Crazy. But they lived this. Absolutely lived this. This is exactly what went on in 99, 2000. Because you're looking at the data in March 2000, and you can probably have the exact same conversation we're having now. And the data looked at that time. Now it's more expensive, but at that time, the data was the value spread was as wide as it had yep. ever been. Exactly. Okay, so that was commentary from Cliff Asnes, who we had in the podcast. His conversation, just as a side note, was intimidating for anyone that's interested. Just just listening to him talk was mentally exhausting. I had to re-listen to the interview. Anyway, he, he was awesome. Great interview. If you haven't oh. listened to it. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant man. Yeah. So that, that was Cliff. Now, this paper is from Cliff's colleagues from AQR. So AQR is the firm Cliff started. Uh, the title of Cliff's, Cliff's post was, is systematic in brackets value investing dead? And that's the same as the title of this paper. So I tried to distill the main points of the paper. So they start off just reminding us what value investors are trying to get. And they break it down into three things. You're getting errors and expectations with uh, with respect to fundamentals. So that's the idea of people underpricing systematically value stocks and overpricing growth stocks. So value investors are trying to take advantage of that. And or a risk premium for exposure to stocks that share exposure to a non-diversifi- non-diversifiable source of risk that is reflected in their current cheapness. And or a premium for investors who are willing to overpay for growth or avoid value, which is a non-risk-based preference. Uh, so they, they also then remind us that value has been strong for decades across stock markets, time periods, and other asset classes. And the guys at AQR have done a ton of research, Cliff, I think in particular on, I think the paper was called Value and 
value everywhere, or value and momentum everywhere, something like that. But then they say, again, reminding us that the recent evidence has been poor, especially in the US. And we know this from the Fama French paper that we talked about not too long ago. And I mean, I guess we talked about it a lot for, separate from that too. Okay. So then they, they, they say, and this is, speaks to the comment you made earlier, Cameron, this underperformance has resulted in ex post critiques to try and rationalize the underperformance. It's exactly what you were talking about. And so they list five critiques. Book to price has not worked for large stocks in a long time, if ever, at least if the value strategy is not applied within industries or sectors. So basically saying value for large stocks using price to book as a measure has never worked, which a lot of people have, have said. And there's some pretty compelling data to, to show that to be true, but it doesn't tell the whole story. I'm getting ahead of myself. The explosion in share repurchase activity of firms has changed the nature of book equity, rendering booked price measures less useful. The growing importance of intangibles and the failure of the accounting system to record such value on the financial statements renders value measures anchored to current financial statements useless. This one I found fascinating. Central bank interventions and the low interest rate environment over the last decade have distorted asset prices via lowering discount rates that negates the eff efficacy of value strategies. And the last one, systematic value strategies are just too naive to work as everyone knows about them. So rather than recounting the whole paper, because they did a, they built a framework to answer these questions and had a whole bunch of other great content. So again, I would read the paper, but I just took their answers to the questions and tried to do a bullet point summary of each one. Pull it away. Uh, okay. So book to price and large cap stocks. They confirm this to be true in the data, but then they also remind us that building a portfolio using a single metric like book to price doesn't make sense. Uh, when you add other valuation metrics, that makes it look a lot better in large caps, makes value look a lot better in large caps. And then they also tell us that while it's not directly related to value, using other systematic sources of return, like quality in the AQR world or profitability in the dimensional world, make value work a lot better, including in large caps. Now on the adding other metrics for valuation, dimensional would say, and I'm putting words in their mouth, but I think I know the words uh, well enough to say this. Dimensional would say that controlling for the other factors in the Fama French five-factor model makes other value valuation metrics less useful. So if you're just looking at, at value, then adding other metrics like price earnings, price sales, price cash flow, whatever, to price book makes it look better. Dimension would say that may be true, but when you control for- Everything else. Yeah. R relative price, size, profitability, and investment, adding in another valuation metric to that model doesn't actually add any value. Right. Exactly. And that probably just comes down to what, what model are you using and how are you seeing the world? At the end of the day, I think it's all pretty similar. So they, they basically confirmed, yes, sure, you can make the argument that using purely price book as a measure for value makes value look pretty bad in large caps in the historical data. But then they also remind us that there's a lot more to think about. On repurchases, so saying that the increase in repurchase makes price book less useful, they sorted US stocks by size, relative price, and repurchase activity, basically with the idea that if repurchases affect the efficacy of value measures, particularly price book, we would expect value to be less effective in the high repurchase group and more, and especially in more recent years where repurchase activity has been extremely high. And so with that model, they find mixed evidence of value working less well for high repurchase, the, the high repurchase subsample. For book price, there is some evidence of lower returns for the high group relative to the zero or low group in the small cap universe, but not in the large cap universe. So I think they said they found mixed, mixed but not conclusive evidence. And then across other value measures, so not price book, and their combined valuation metric, there was no evidence either way for a relationship to uh, buybacks. I should have referenced it. I, Dimensional did a paper on this a while ago showing as an accounting proof why share repurchases don't affect book value as a valuation measure. So- and if you want a good time, go check out Cliff's tweets talking about share buybacks. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite something. We had a guest. I can't reveal who it is. They made a comment. It's a future guest. They made a comment about buybacks. And I said, D D buybacks are divisive. And their response before they answered the question in a very with a very smart answer, they said, yeah, buybacks are divisive. They divide the people who understand finance and those, and those that don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Anyway, for both small and large caps, they found no systematic evidence that price book performs worse for firms that repurchase the most. So basically they found there's no relationship. And this is a direct quote. They said, even though share repurchases, re share repurchase intensity has increased over our sample period, it is not the case that book price has performed worse more recently for share repurchase intensive firms. Basically no relationship. The growing importance of intangibles. So I think this is a big one with the tech companies. Yep. Comes up a lot. 
So they say that if the issue is a systematic accounting error that affects an asset, for example, research and development costs, then comparing similar firms within an industry should help to mitigate it. So that's just an easy, if you're worried about this in portfolio construction, then you should just sort within industries, which is one of the comments Cliff made in his piece about how actual portfolio managers do it. And Dimensional does this too by putting a cap on each industry. Now, they also said that there are data vendors that are, that are selling data that's in quotation marks corrected for the accounting flaws. Now, these corrections, they note, require a bunch of decisions on their own. So just like the accounting metrics in the first place have a bunch of decisions, subjective decisions, which you could call flaws, so do the corrections that are made in the data. And so then they said, if these data vendors think that they can build better data to build better valuation metrics, I mean, let's test it. <laughs> Easy solution. Uh, now, direct quote again, a key inference to be drawn here is that the recent underperformance of value strategies extends to value measures that attempt to correct for deficiencies in the financial reporting system. It appears unlikely that the growing importance of intangibles or changes in business models ex is explaining the underperformance of value strategies. So I think that's, again, addressing the sort of winner-take-all tech, big data argument of values underperformance. Now, this is one of my favorites, and I've been spending a bunch of time researching the relationships between central banks, monetary policy, and financial markets. So this one, just based on what I've been reading recently, was interesting. Uh, central bank interventions in the low interest rate environment over the last decade have distorted asset prices via lowering discount rates that negates the efficacy of value strategies. And I've heard this one a bunch too. Like value is not going to work anymore because of the monetary environment that we're in. So they break this down by saying that equity valuation frameworks are based on discounted future cash flows. Gross stock valuations consist of a larger speculative component of future cash flows. Based on this, and so this is them explaining why people would say this, how people can justify saying that the monetary environment and the interest rate environment is affecting the value growth relative performance. So based on this and leaning on the intuition of the duration concept from fixed income, value stocks are effectively short duration assets. And as such, their prices will move inversely with interest rates. On the first two points, they said, okay, I can see that. And on the last point, their comment was, but now the arguments are either unreasonable or tenuous at best. So then they go on to ask, what interest rate are we talking about? The equity valuation discount rate consists of a risk-free rate and a risky rate. Which risk-free rate are we referring to? Is it the absolute level? And then the other piece is that, is it the absolute level of rates or the change in rates that we're saying is affecting the relative performance of value in growth stocks? Yeah. Wow. Well, you can't just say, oh, interest rates affect performance of value stocks. Okay. Which interest rates? Yeah. And is it the shape of the yield curve? And then they ask the question, does duration, the concept of duration, does that even carry over to stocks? Does that make sense to say? And they argue no, because equity expected cash flows are not fixed like bond interest is. So the whole math behind duration breaks down and it breaks down because when the external environment changes, expected cash flows also change, which is not true for bonds. But with stocks, yeah, I mean, it is. When the external environment changes, expected cash flows change too. So they basically say, well, again, direct quote, what looks like an appealing casual explanation for the troubles of value over the last decade, i.e. low rates benefiting assets with longer dated claims, and that's that idea of growth stocks, having these big, huge expected future cash flows far in the future, is only minimally supported by the data and then only contemporaneously and not predictively. And they did have some re regression models to support that last statement there. Okay. And then the last one, systematic value strategies are just too naive to work because everybody knows about them. So they agree that it's always reasonable to consistently ask whether or not a characteristic will be associated with higher future returns. Like we know what's happened in the past. Is it still reasonable to expect? And this is what the Fama French paper earlier this year was trying to get at. Can we still expect a positive value premium based on what's happened in the last decade or so? So then they, they, their, their comment is that we have to remember why we held the prior belief, which basically just back, gets back to the Bayesian updating concept where if you've got really strong priors, it takes really strong new information to change your prior. In the case of value, the prior belief consists of, and the, the theoretical side consists of hard to diversify risk and expectation errors. And both of those should be persistent through time, particularly the risk. I don't know. I, the expectation errors piece, you can make arguments based on human biases that aren't going to go away, that that should be persistent. I think we've talked about that in the past on here, but the risk piece I think is pretty good. And then here's the, the centerpiece, in my opinion. If it did become the case that value was being crowded out, like if value went away because there are too many people putting money into the strategy, basically it is being arbitraged away, we would expect a compression in value spreads. But we're seeing the opposite. The value spreads is getting wider. Wider, exactly. 
Yeah. So in one of these, I think it was in Cliff's piece, he said that people are just really willing for whatever reason to overpay for growth right now. And well, that was his quote, right? Investors are simply paying way more than usual for the stocks they love versus the ones they hate. Yeah. That's that was it. his ending quote. And if you believe the different stocks will have different expected returns or different returns in the future, by definition, there has to be value stocks. Some stocks have to have higher expected returns. Well, why is that? And if the premium's gone, if it's gone, it doesn't mean value stocks are going to underperform forever. I mean, that was Cliff's joke about the spread going to infinity. That's not what you'd expect. If the premium is gone, you'd expect a random outcome going forward, which doesn't mean constant underperformance. It just means you wouldn't expect a positive long-term return, but you could still get positive periods of positive returns. It's not like, oh, the value premium is gone. That doesn't mean value is going to underperform forever. That just means you don't expect a positive premium on average, Yeah, which is not the same thing as constant underperformance. Right. So on to our planning topic, something we started, I think, four weeks ago talking about the risk profile. We skipped it last time, but I've had a couple of people actually email me for a change asking when we're going to follow up with the back half of our uh, risk profile discussion. So we talked last time about the two broad approaches to measuring someone's risk tolerance. One is the psychometric profiling, which basically is a series of questions that describe your longer term risk taking mindset. So that's very traditional in our industry to use a psychometric type questionnaire. The other one, which we talked about at length last time is the choice of gambles or prospect theory. So we talked last time and we found it, I found it pretty compelling. This paper written by four academics that one of the big players in this space risk lies at commission. And that paper made a pretty strong case for the benefit of getting people to focus on their near-term downside risk because that's all that really matters, that that GMO point, get me out point, where is that point for you? And it was very compelling. And since then, we've had a chance to dig into the arguments that look at the psychometric side of things. And what I find appealing about that is that psychometric responses are much more stable over time than the the other gamble near term downside tolerance type questions, and so psychometric responses are more stable. Things like how easily do you adapt when things go wrong financially that typically doesn't change over time. When you think of the word risk in a financial context, which of the following words come to mind first? Danger, uncertainty, opportunity, or thrill. And I know when you first looked at that questionnaire, the word thrill, I think you found that is a bit of a Turn off in that sense, right? I did. I, when I think about rational risk taking, the last thing that comes to mind is thrill. Opportunity makes a lot of sense to me. Right. Like if I'm taking a risk with a positive expected outcome, I'm not doing it for the thrill. <laughs> no, because thrill is not rational. Another one would be when faced with a major financial decision, are you more concerned about the possible losses or the possible gains? And what's neat is that you can then take these responses, aggregate them. And then come up to us with a score and then compare that score to other people with the similar scores. You can see where you might be different from people in that population. Frankly, one of the best arguments against the prospect theory or the gambling questions is that it is gamified and it's not really like real life. And there's some high stat, like I, I think it's like 30%, I seem to recall, of the population either can't do the math or don't want to do a math type question. That's a big swath of the population. Psychometric questions are much easier, much, much easier to answer. And there's also been some commentary about how people know how the gamble questions work. So the fact that it's a game and gamble questions, they might feel they have to prove something in that. So I've talked to other people and they said, ideally you would do both of these in a risk questionnaire type scenario to determine you know, what is your best risk profile? And the reality is in, in our world, this is only one part of determining someone's risk profile. You also have to take a look at, you know, what is their capacity to take on the risk? How stable is their job? What's their time horizon? Like a lot of people say, well, just have your age and bonds. So well, that's clearly flawed, right? That doesn't take into account any of this psychometric or the, the gamble side. It's just time horizon alone. And the other thing we always link it to as well is, their long-term financial plan. Like how much risk do you need to take on? And this discussion we've had a lot lately where if you don't need to take on the risk, are you the type of person that would choose not to take on the risk? Or are you rational human being no matter what? 
I don't need the risk, but it makes sense to take on the risk for rational reasons. And that's really a preference, I think. It's a preference and it's got to do with the marginal utility. I think it's like objectively more wealth is always better than less, but at the margin, there's a point where more wealth starts to mean a whole lot less. And to some people, if they can reduce the risk, they'll do it all day long. That's just the way they're wired. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's to be aware of this. Yeah, it's interesting. Last up, bad advice of the week. So man, with the collapse of the price of oil, I remembered going back to 2008. I don't know if you remember this story or not, but the Jeff Rubin prediction of the price of oil back in 2008. So Jeff Rubin, who was the at the time the chief economist at CIBC World Markets, clearly brilliant economist. This is not a commentary on him, but more about the making predictions and making decisions in your portfolio based on big time predictions. So in April 2008, he predicted that a barrel of oil would cost $225 by 2012. And oil was $118 a barrel at that point. So it was a very controversial call, got lots of press. And he, he wrote about it in his book called The World is About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller. So the basic premise was that oil is the single most important factor of global economic progress. And that based on that, the demand for oil is going to go up, prices are going to soar. Who would have thought that it would be almost worthless recently on the May contracts and certainly a fraction of what it was back then? Yeah. So there's an article back in Canadian Business in 2012 that said of, of Ruben, quote, he joins the ranks of such famous Canadian pop experts as demographer David Foote. There's another one I want to do in another future, uh, future podcast. Technology guru Don Tapscott and resource scarcity warrior Thomas Homer Dixon and a long list of other self-declared wise men who made a living telling the nervous masses what the future holds. So it was wrong back in 2012. Look at it now. Yeah. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Now, you could argue this point because they all thought they had basis to make a prediction, but I, I, I heard Fama speak recently. And in a, in a future episode, we might talk a little bit about that talk that he gave. But one of the things he said, I think he was asked what he thinks the outcome of the whole coronavirus situation is going to be. And his response was, was just so Fama. He said, if, if I don't have the basis to make a prediction, I won't make it. Classic Fama. <laughs> yeah. Anything else today? Nope. I think we covered a whole lot of stuff. The well simple piece pushed us a little long. Oh, I talked about the length. You talked about it first, though. That's all right. Anyways, thanks for listening. 